Hello, fans of Psychosemantic Podcast and Cinema Psyops. This is Jerry from Kill the Cast, here to show y'all an episode of Atomic Age Saucer Cast, which features Court and Darren. We come together once a month to talk about the atomic age of horror and sci-fi and also give you history lessons on what was going on in the world dealing with communism and, you know, the fear of the bomb coming at us. So enjoy this one as we cover Matinee, which, while not from the decade we normally talk about, is set there, deals with the Cuban Missile Crisis, and is all around an amazing movie. So that's why you're seeing this in their feeds today, just so you can see what they've been doing outside of their own podcast. So if you like it, check out the Kill the Cast feed on Legion, and enjoy. Hello everyone, welcome to Atomic Age SaucerCast. My name is Jerry, and joining us is our Cuban Missile Crisis expert, Darren. This goes back a long time, guys, but I stopped myself at three pages of notes, which I will cut down into two minutes of gibberish. <laughs> wow, I'm excited to hear it. I almost wish it was all three pages. Uh, and then also joining us, the king of gimmicks, we've got Quartz Psyops. Wow, yes, I am very much the king of gimmicks. I've developed a podcasting situation where when you listen to it, it sounds like you are exactly in the same room as Matt and I, and then ghosts come through your wall and drip blood directly on you. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to remember you're actually an adult. <laughs> yes, that too. Wow. Okay. Uh, I've got a complaint. Uh, I've never had uh, the blood drip from my walls because of ghosts when listening to Cinema Psyops. But I have felt like I was in the room with you and Matt, which usually is why I turn it off. (laughs) Yeah, we don't wear pants, and that makes people uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. Well, and as Jerry reiterated last week, he's he's more less of a fan of Matt than he is of you, of course. (laughs) Everybody is. We just try to pretend to everybody that, that Matt is the one that everybody listens in for, just because it helps Matt, you know? keep going and, and doing it but really everybody's there for me we know that well good thing well, he doesn't listen to this <laughs> <laughs> yeah matt doesn't listen to anything he's not on we've established that yeah. which is why we have the ongoing joke of making fun of matt because he'll never know <laughs> all as right as everybody's cool <laughs> <laughs> no cool one anybody. tell him maddie doesn't know get your <laughs> Get your heads out of the sand, people, and don't tell Matt. Okay, so today we have a very special episode because while we are leaving the 1950s for when this movie was made, the movie takes place in the 1950s. So we are looking at Matinee from 1993, starring our man John Goodman, directed by Joe Dante. Um... This movie is amazing. I actually only saw it for the first time uh, two years ago when someone was like, this is this movie's up your alley. You like all that 50 shit. You need to see it. And I watched it and I was blown away. And it's one since we started this podcast. We knew we wanted to do. We just didn't exactly know when we were going to do it. And if we could, then we decided we can do whatever we want. So we did it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like our first four or five fucking episodes that we've we've done we've referenced this anyway so (laughs) and even in talking about like what kind of movies we were going to cover i think i referenced it saying it you know like the kind of movies that were in matinee (laughs) yeah matinee 100 percent is like the mascot for this podcast (laughs) right i mean it really solidified the love i think for all three of us of those kinds of films that were featured or made like they were in matinee yeah like mance I want Mant. I want an actual fucking version of Mant. The Blu-ray has, like, all the scenes from it clipped together for 16 minutes, and it kind of works, but it's not, like, the whole entirety of the movie. Yeah, Uh, yeah. I I was hoping that it, uh, even though it wasn't that long, it's like, oh, it's going to be a short film. It's like, well, kind of, but... Yeah, I mean, it still works. It's fun to watch, but it's not... It's not the same. I would love to see a full version of Man. I wish they would have taken the time just to shoot a shit movie like that. (laughs) Yeah, um, and and I like honestly, I would love to take like the poster of this and like redo it for Atomic Age Saucer Cast. Like, for matinee or for Mant? For it has, it has I, I mean, for, I was talking about the poster for Matinee. 
Oh. <laughs> but I, because I'm looking at it right now on IMDb. But uh, I, we, yeah, we could all. I could also look at the man poster and see what I could come up with. I have no ability to draw, but I will write ideas on a pa- piece of paper and use that as the picture. Oh, Darren's our resident poster manipulator. I, I do dabble in document alteration. I and I have spent some time last night scrolling through and downloading large images. Oh so, snap! Uh, I and it's I just, a rainy fucking day. So I just like when I see the matinee, like they have like the movie theater in front and it's got the matinee kind of doing the V thing. I just see like one side saying atomic age and the other side saying saucer cast. And then like you have the nuclear explosion, but then you also throw in like like the UFO from uh, the day the earth stood still. And you throw a couple of other like references to those movies, like put an ant. Well, I guess it's already got an ant because it's got the, the man. So that that works. But, well, like a Sergeant Pepper's album cover, but for yeah. everything we've done on the show. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> like, I don't know if you would keep John Goodman or replace John Good. Like, I almost thought about, like, you replace John Goodman with, like, an alien from one of the movies. Obviously not Invisible Invaders, because you can't fucking see him. But, uh, like, Invasion of the Saucer Man alien, like, right there. Well, the, the Invisible Invaders are covered by any ant hills that are there, because that's what their footprints look like anyway. That's true. They are making <laughs> waves of sand. So, okay. So, uh, Court, what has been your experience? Well, like, what was your first experience with Matinee? I don't know exactly when it hit cable, but it came out in 93, and it was shortly after that. So it, it was on Stars and uh, Encore, but mostly Stars when I was a kid. So we're talking, like, in the 90s. At my youngest, I was, like, age-appropriate to have a crush on all the girls in the film. <laughs> like, that young. And uh, it was on Stars, and back in that time, Stars used to have a channel where they would play four movies that equaled out to, I think, about six hours, like, six times or four times a day to do, like, a full 24-hour marathon of them. And they'd play the same four movies all day. And matinee was one of those. And it seemed like every time I would wake up as a kid in the summer, I would wake up just in time to watch matinee. And then pretty much when I was ready to fall asleep, then the next time around matinee would be on. That happened with a couple of other movies as well, where I became really obsessed with them and watched them a ton from that specific 24 hour constant cycle channel. But that's what really solidified my love of this movie. I've probably seen this film over a hundred times. Wow. I think I've probably seen it, like, five times in the past two years. It's not bad. Not a bad number for two years. That is <laughs> yeah. Good. That's a good number. Uh, okay, Darren, what is your experience with this film? Well, I have uh, little little memories of uh, my high school age sister took, took me to see this in one of the theaters. Uh, it was probably... 11 or 12 when this came out uh, what came out in january yeah i was like 12 when this came out and uh my high school age sister took me to see it and i really wasn't all that interested in it at the time it was a movie my sister wanted to take me to <laughs> you know because she was either babysitting me or something but when it came out on video uh, we were a big video renting Dad had the double VCR. Sorry, Dad. I don't know if the FBI if the FBI still prosecutes that. I made that memory up. Um, but she would rent this pretty regularly, and then it sort of became I started renting it, and I hadn't seen it for fucking ever. And then it got re released on was it a shout Arrow? Arrow. Well, I'm sh- uh, someone else did release it also. I, I have the Arrow release there there was a no frills blu-ray that somebody did i think it was the original um distribute distribution company then arrow video released a deluxe double disc package is the one that i bought and then after that shout factory did it and i've been burned by buying shout factory after having a arrow release Mm. uh by the burbs particularly so (laughs) i didn't go for that one and i just stuck with my uh, arrow release for it 
I'm pretty sure I don't have the arrow release. I'm pretty sure what I have is the shout. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's it's a shout select. Yeah, I, it's got the cover is crawling out of the cover and yeah. I'll I'll take my arrow release. That arrow release looks has a much better cover. Yeah, I I usually don't double up. Uh, the, I've got like five copies of the thing in my house, but I really don't Same. double up all that much. You know, uh, I don't have that affliction. With I don't most know if movies. it if it has special features that are really good. That's about the only thing that'll double up for me. Unless it's a, like if it's a new scan, there's also a chance. Like if it's a better. If it used to be a 2K scan and now it's a 4K scan, I might get it. Yeah, that, that would definitely be something that I'm more of a print upgrader at this point. I don't really do a lot of the special features that I used to. Um, although now that the world is ending and I'm trapped inside my house, it seems like special features have become important to me again. Yeah. <laughs> But um, for a while there, for like the longest time, I just I didn't have the time for it. So it was all just trying to get the best print possible. And I've I hate to to really bag on a particular release company, but I know that their shout select line, they take a little bit more time because they're movies that they they spend a little bit more on. But some of their other releases, again, like the Burbs, that was I think that was a shout select as well, maybe. But their print of the Burbs is terrible compared to what was their for the arrow release it's super dark and it's just really hard to see and it's it just i don't know it looks like they used way too much dnr and it just dropped that <laughs> dropped the level of the film altogether Ugh. when will and, companies learn dnr is not their friend yeah i mean give us the fucking grain <laughs> just let us see the image as it is and scan it and then maybe clean up the actual like destructive parts of the print but grain is good we love the green we're used to it yeah I, arrow's my favorite company when it comes to releases hands down um i probably have more arrow yeah. releases than anything else shout is probably the screen factor line probably is my second but arrow is is kind of where i like feel the most plus arrow is always putting out japanese films and I'm a huge Japanese cinema f guy, so, like, that that works for me. Like, I just did an order on Arrow for their summer sale, and, uh, like, I, I was just, like, I picked up, like, two or three just cheap Japanese movie releases. Yeah, and again, I don't hate the, I don't hate Shout Factory, I don't hate Scream Factory, I know I bag on their stuff for their prints a lot. But I, that's all I really want, is, I mean, I'm buying a movie to be able to see it, so don't don't fuck up me being able to see it in some way, shape, or form. And then everything else is just a, a nice add-on or a bonus. Yeah. Well, at least it didn't do me dirty like Kino did. Kino, y'all's Cabin Boy release, y'all didn't clean that up at all. That still got scratches all in it. It looks like you added more grain. I don't know. They they screwed me over on Cabin Boy. I'm very upset. <laughs> you you and Vanessa and like one person I'm forgetting need to do an episode on Cabin Boy somewhere. I will you, fucking do it. <laughs> Vanessa always talks about it. You're one of them fancy lads, there, aren't you? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Cabin Boy is like probably my top five comedies. Easily. So until Shit's Creek came along, it was my absolute favorite Chris Elliott thing ever. Mm. <laughs> now that Shit's Creek exists, it is my new favorite Chris Elliott thing. It's my favorite role of his is rolling shit. I haven't <laughs> seen it. I'll have to watch it because I love Chris Elliott. Um, all right. We are getting off topic. So we, uh, as a forewarning, um, my dumb ass uh, maybe erased my notes for this about 10 minutes before we started recording. So, I may or may not be relying on the internet to help me through this. Uh, as for, like, walking through the movie. So, yeah. My bad, guys. Sorry. Fucking. But it's, this it's, is why recycle bins are important and undo levels are needed in all of your word processing, kids. Well, that's the thing, is my fucking note app on my phone has an undo. I hit the undo, and all it brought back was an exclamation point. <laughs> it's because oh, it's only it's it's only the one level of undo and you had one exclamation point that you deleted after you deleted everything else by accident i probably i did it's definitely my fault my bad but um we've That's got a good I memory of the film 
and I'm mostly I, just using uh, help for the actual walkthrough of the movie. That's why I use Google Docs for my phone if I take notes because it has multiple levels of undo, so I can always fix my fuck ups. <sighs> God, I know my dad wishes he could undo his fuck ups, but then I wouldn't be here with you guys. Samesies. <laughs> okay, so in October 1962, teenager Gene Loomis. Loomis, that's a familiar name. That was intentional, I'm sure. Oh, that's yeah. Joe Dante for you. Yeah. And his younger brother, Dennis, moved to Key West, Florida, where their fathers deployed to work on a submarine just off the naval base. Shortly after their arrival, a televised speech by U.S. President John F. Kennedy announces the threat of an impending nuclear attack from Cuba and the panic strikes the nation. That's a pretty good setup for what I would call the background of the movie. That's within like the first five or six minutes, man. Like they leave the movie and shit like the first movie that they're going to see where the trailer of Mant pops up. Um, they leave and then as they're coming back, you hear it on the news, you see all this other stuff and the mom's like on edge because their dad's already been deployed. I mean, that's the very basic background setup of the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Normally I have this written down scene by scene, but you know, fuck me. Um, well, that's going by my memory. Cause as I mentioned, I've seen it like a hundred goddamn yeah. times. <laughs> so, uh, the, it's cool because you get to see him taking his little brother to the movie theater and his little brother being scared and him kind of teasing his little brother and then, you know, uh, he meets up with this other guy who lives on base who obviously he does not like who wants to go shoot frogs for some reason. That's... I really I, I really do like the way that um, Gene as it is as an older brother. Like, he's trying to scare his brother and he's trying to keep him busy, so he's having a little bit of fun with him. But his brother also digs scary movies, too, and he kind of likes being scared. And so Gene's kind of amping him up and getting him all worked up just because it's fun for him to be terrified, too. And then they come across this kid who wants to go shoot frogs for no reason other than just to watch him explode. And Gene's like, no, that's disgusting, Dennis. We are not doing that. And Dennis, being the little brother who idolizes Gene, just automatically goes, yeah, that's disgusting. We're not doing that. And watching it this time for the show, I was watching it with my wife, and I remember saying to her specifically, holy shit, Gene's a really good older brother. Yeah, exactly. He, throughout this whole movie, he really is like a good, good brother. Um, he's a almost, good all-around dude. He's just yeah, seems to he, be trying to help everybody. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like he acts like an older brother, like to the world around him. Like he's trying to take care of everybody and trying to make life just a little bit better for everybody and do what he can. And he's like the kind of kid that you totally wish you could have hung out with at that age. One hundred percent. He's also a great wingman, but we'll get to that later. So, at uh, the next day at school. You kind of have, like, Gene getting introduced to other people, him letting people know that he's, uh, his dad's out there on one of the submarines and stuff, and, uh, this is where he starts actually making friends, but we have a really important scene here where they do the, uh, air raid drill in the hallways, and we meet the character Sandra, who basically is like, I'm not doing this because the bombs drop, this isn't gonna save us, like, why would you think getting on your knees and covering your neck with your hands would save? What is that supposed to save you from? And uh, she gets in trouble for that. So let's I talk about love, this. I also love the fucking description that she gives of like basically what does happen when you get radiation sickness, where she's literally just trying to inform everyone that this is so ridiculous. This bomb is not something that is good. We get this attack that happens, we're not going to be saved by being in the hallway. She describes about how you start bleeding from your intestines and you start throwing up only you're throwing up your organs and you can't stop your hair falling out, grossing everybody out and terrifying everybody. And the poor teachers are just trying to give the kids some semblance of if you do this, maybe we'll be okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> and she's just totally squashing that and talking about what's going to happen. And she's like, it's actually better if you die in the blast. You're going to be much safer and happier to die in the blast because otherwise you have a slow, agonizing death. And, and the whole time she's. Oh, go ahead. Well, let's say, and frog shooting kid says, that girl's a communist. <laughs> yeah, because he's like ultra. He's 
like the typical uh, I should have gone to basic because I should have been a soldier kind of militia man that, you know, did the prepping and is ready to go for living inside their bunker for eight months and can't make it two days without demanding a haircut. Pretty much. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I love this because I feel like this girl, Sandra, I feel like she's us. She is us when we were in. School. I I know for me, because I would always do shit like this, uh, though mine was usually, like, uh, a little bit later in life, but, like, when I was in high school and, like, the half a year I went to high school in Alabama and everything was very Christian and there was no separation of church and state, I would blast that shit all the time and I got in lo- loads of uh, beatings and shit for it. But, like, I was that kind of guy that would call out stuff. Well, I was de- I definitely had that uh, that same kind of attitude and, and did that sort of thing. But uh, I was like a mixture of like her and Jean a little bit <laughs> more than anything. Uh, I really dug this character. And I had when I was a kid, I had a huge crush on Sandra. I was like, I have to find a girl like that. I got to date someone like that. She's fiery. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 There was, uh, you know, I, I bring this up so often but you know my parents used to take me to a lot of protests and stuff when i was a kid and there was always the odd couple years older political girl that i was like yes i love you (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, so yeah when the prepubescent darren in the theater was like yes this girl's fucking awesome marry me (laughs) Um, okay, so uh, Gene ends up bonding with a boy named Stan over his love of horror films, and the two make plans to see B-movie producer Lawrence Wolsey's latest feature, Mant, about a man who has been transformed into an ant as a result of an atomic mutation. Woo! People should recognize Stan from the TV show Erie, Indiana, which was pretty big right around this time in Saturday Morning Cartoon Land. Also produced and uh, some of the episodes directed by John, uh, Joe Dante, I mean. So, uh, you know, he used a lot of the same people over and over again, which we'll talk about when other characters pop up. But I really love to see the kid from Erie, Indiana pop up in this. Yeah. Also, isn't he the main boy in Hocus Pocus? I believe uh, so, yeah. yes. Yeah, he's I great. Was, I, I love was, him. I was thinking so. But he's apparently left left acting and become a hairdresser, according to Joe Dante. Oh, okay. Well, sure. Um, So Stan introduces Gene to his crush, uh, Sherry, and encourages his new friend to invite a girl to the screening. Now, the fun part about this is, like, Stan is all like, you just got to tell a girl what you want. You just got to mac on her. And then he, like, as soon as he talks to Sherry, he's, like, dumbfounded and stumbling over his words and jaws dropped on the floor. Like, he's over here telling... Uh, Gene that, you know, this is the make out capital of the world and I can't do anything but stare with my mouth open like I'm Nancy in Nightmare on Elm Street when I'm around <laughs> this girl. It's like I, the dog that catches the car. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny because I think what Stan is used to is girls trying to play coy and be shy if he's not completely a blowhard and full of shit, which I also believe he is. But the minute he finds a woman like and this is usually most of these guys that always think that they're in charge and they're all cool and they know how things work with women. But the minute he finds a woman who is completely in touch with herself and her own desires, he can't fucking handle it. And he gets all panicky. And that is hilarious. Yes. So, OK, uh, later, uh, Gene and Stan watch as frightened townspeople swarm the grocery store frantically purchasing food to prepare for the imminent uh, COVID-19, I meant nuclear destruction. Uh, oh, yeah, this uh, this panic buying sequence really hit home this time around, man. Really, really hit home. It's the first time I really noticed the woman grabbing all the toilet paper in this scene. <laughs> the fight over the last box of shredded wheat <laughs> surviving the apocalypse with the last box of shredded wheat really rang home with me. I'm like, God damn, this is... This is hard to watch. It's really accurate, and people don't fucking change. Yep. Yeah. Gotta have my Wheaties. Remember when everybody went out and bought a bunch of gas uh, on 9-11? Yeah, I was one of the people that panic bought gas. I filled up my tank just to make sure because we didn't know what was going to happen. I remember. You should have waited till now, and they'd give you a gas station for yeah. $3. <laughs> for real. I almost got arrested on 9-11, so that's fun. 
Um, okay, so Gene's mother suggests he distracts Dennis by taking him to see a lighthearted comedy filmed at the local movie theater. Bored, the boys walk out of the screening and... In- oh, hold up, time out. You can't skip over the movie. So, the movie they go see is about <laughs> a girl's... What is it? Her uncle, who has been... her His soul is now possessing a shopping cart... I thought he got turned into a shopping cart or something like that, but it was called like the wacky shopping cart or something. Yeah. It's a, it's a total Disney-esque or kids movie of this era that is absolute shit. <laughs> and I love the sequence when the mom says that, you know, no more monsters or, you know, the movie doesn't have monsters or whatever. And then little fucking Dennis looks at his mom and he goes, no monsters. And he gives this like completely flustered and angry face. And when I was watching it with my wife, I paused it. I'm like, that is me right there. You see that face? You see how disappointed he is? That is me at that age. <laughs> oh, for sure. I'm with you. I, I grew up a monster boy. That that was my, my gig. Creature yeah, features and Godzilla. <laughs> that was me and Jerry right there. <laughs> Little Dennis like, no monsters. Yeah, no Shopping monsters. carts. This is lame. <laughs> Dar- Darren was, was out uh, politically protesting uh George Bush Sr. while you and I were whining that we couldn't watch Rodan. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that, like, Frankenstein Conquers the World is nowhere to be found on VHS in my local vicinity. <laughs> I'm so upset. How will I know how he beats Baragon? I uh, see more good Baragon. old-fashioned boycott. That'll uh, get him to get the movies. That's true. Uh, so... Yeah, I, I just think that was that's funny. Um, so when they walk out of the screening, they encounter two men named Herb. Uh, you know what, Court? Go ahead. Tell us about Herb. Oh, are you talking about Dick Miller? I mean, everybody should know Dick Miller, right? Yes. <laughs> the minute he pops up, everybody should know him from being Mr. Futterman, at least if you've seen Gremlins, or maybe the old drunken uncle from Demon Knight. I mean, Dick Miller has been in hundreds and hundreds of fucking movies. Cab uh, Driver yeah. in Inner Space was possibly the first time I also saw, a Joe saw Dante him movie. after Gremlins. Yeah. Um, also a Joe Dante movie. There are two actors that Joe Dante loves to put in just about everything he's in when he can. One of them is Dick Miller. The other one will show up shortly whenever we actually get to him, whenever he starts interacting with Lawrence Woolsey. But... I mean, how much how much should I really go on about Dick Miller? Everybody should know this guy. Yeah, I'm just upset that, like, we're talking about Dick Miller and you didn't bring up A Bucket of Blood, his greatest movie ever made. Walter Paisley. That's usually what his name is in just about everything, including Chopping Mall, where he was. <laughs> yeah. The, the janitor named Walter Paisley, who had a bucket that mysteriously looked a lot like blood that he was mopping the floor with. I don't know if anybody noticed that. But... Yeah, I mean... Someone geez. just watched Joe Bob on Friday night. Yeah, absolutely. And also, uh, well, he was Walter Paisley, I think, in The Terminator when he was the guy that ran the ammo and gun store that The Terminator gets all of his stuff from and then gets killed. Oh, oh yeah. So he's, he's he's played Walter Paisley like a fucking shitload because of, because of Bucket of Blood. Yeah, that's true. So joining Herb is Bob, and they are protesting Mance tactless subject matter they are saying this movie uh should not be talking about this when we are in a nuclear crisis that is waiting to happen and how dare they try to show this trash to our children think of the children and how they will be affected by watching a 1950s sci-fi movie which are some of the most american and patriotic movies you will ever watch uh, I also want to point out that they were upset that it teaches kids that it's okay for mutations to rip the clothes off of young women. <laughs> That's mm. one of the lines that stuck with me that uh, Bob says. <laughs> okay, maybe they have a little bit of a point. Um, <laughs> well, I, what they're clearly doing here is a good old-fashioned ballyhoo. Um, whenever you're watching it, you know what's going on, where they're trying to make people think that they're going to see something much more shocking and upsetting than what they actually are. And we kind of hinted around it, but Lawrence Woolsey is basically William Castle. I mean, he's straight up fucking William Castle. Yeah, yeah, I was about to get to that. Um, 
And that's the kind of thing that William Castle would do, too. So it's God awesome it. that they did it this way. You said Ballyhoo, and in, like, the past week, I've been watching, like, a bunch of horror documentaries. And, like, if John Landis is in that documentary, he has to say Ballyhoo. <laughs> like, but if it's... you watch the Grindhouse documentary, he says, not not the Tarantino shit, like, actual Grindhouse, uh, American Grindhouse is name. <laughs> he says it in there. And in um, one of my favorite documentaries ever made, Machete Wielding Maidens, about making horror movies in the Philippines, um, he says Ballyhoo in there like 20 fucking times. He always says Ballyhoo. The only time he doesn't say Ballyhoo is when people die from helicopter wrecks. <laughs> then he says, I'm out of here. Sue someone else. Yep. Let me go speak at their funeral. <laughs> you dick. Um uh- I do love the term ballyhoo because it really represents the kind of way that they would try to get butts in the seats in the theaters at this time. Uh, In the actual, like when you're looking at the theater, there's a little moniker of like a banner that's right across the very bottom that says fight pay TV, which was a big thing that drive-ins and theaters were trying to do to try and counteract cable. Cause if cable could start showing the kind of things that they were showing, it's all done for them. So they were really fighting against TV because people were staying home. And that's why they started this like overboard production and just crazy over the top. Ballyhoo is a better term. This is the best term for it, where it was just this crazy circus act kind of, you know, carnival barking at people to get their asses in the theaters because they were trying to combat the comfort of their own home and TV. Yeah, and this was a big thing worldwide. Uh, Japan had a huge problem with it in the 60s going into the 70s. It's one of the reasons Godzilla movies changed to be more aimed towards kids. Uh, It it was a pretty big issue. It's the reason Godzilla movies dropped in budget, and we got Godzilla vs. Megalon, which I love, for the record. Yeah, I mean... Right, but also didn't they, in Japan, didn't they also start making movies that were more adult-oriented on stuff that couldn't be shown on TV, and that's where the Pinku Iga stuff came from? And yes, the in, the, in the 70s, you got the Roman porno and the pinky violent stuff uh, that that became really popular and started bringing in the money uh, because, like, those movies, you would have, like, great sets and costuming, but it was all about a woman naked, tied upside down, and having her stomach inflated. <laughs> list of things i'd like to see in a movie too <laughs> uh i mean i i may perhaps can tell you names of certain movies where things like this may uh happen <laughs> um all right well we'll do that list off the air nobody <clears throat> needs to know that stuff unless they contact jerry directly through pm yeah well, well you guys said violent stuff machete and cuban missile crisis so that kind of Excuse ah! me to uh, <laughs> segue. <laughs> segue. I don't into... remember saying missile crisis. I remember I'll saying very beginning TV very... theater crisis. Missile crisis. There, Darren, go. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> or or uh, lawsuits. You were talking about lawsuits in 1952. An activist lawyer named uh, Fidel Castro tried suing the dictator of his country. For violating their constitution, the courts said, ah, "You know, he's 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 our dictator. We're not going to listen to you." So he organized an armed uprising, which was squashed. He was jailed for two years, sent to Mexico when he was released, where he met Che, and then he came back. The U.S. saw that uh, things the 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 capitalist government of. Uh, Cuba is probably going to crumble. So the U.S. started a trade and arms embargo in 1958. In 1959, Castro and the Cuban Revolution overthrew Batista. Castro went to the USA because at this point the USA was, well, you know, he's, you know, they they do want to give, you know, medicine to everybody, which we don't really like that idea of. Uh, but he's not we a communist don't. yet. We still don't. Yeah. So, you know, they were doing this peaceful thing, and Castro came to D.C., but he got together with Nixon. Uh, I didn't find everything that was said between the two, but after he went back home, 
Nixon was like, this guy's this guy's going to be a fucking commie. We need to do some we need to do some shit. So um, in 1959, John Dulles uh, was the secretary of state for Eisenhower. I don't you might recognize the name. He is brother of Alan Dulles, head, the longest running head of the CIA, who you might know from such coups as the Iran coup of 1953, the coup in Guatemala in 54. Uh, but they they all got together and uh, you know they started uh, what Operation Mongoose, which you will know from the movie JFK, which was uh, we want to overthrow the Cuban government, but we want to encourage the Cuban people to do it so we don't get in trouble. Because typical CIA CIA playbook anyway for doing that kind of thing where they fund the rebellions and pretend like they had nothing to do with it. Yeah, we, we will help you overthrow this guy who overthrew the guy who we helped overthrow the other guy. Because if we uh, keep your country destabilized, <laughs> we can continue to get goods from you at very cheap prices. Yeah. So there, uh, there, everything was going great for America. <laughs> they had the rebels trained. They were going to do this. They were going to do that. They got... In trouble, they, they uh, the story was that Cubans got so upset with Castro that they hijacked one of their own planes and bombed one of their own military bases and then went to America to defect. And then the, uh, the Secretary of State went to the UN because the UN said, hey, you know, that kind of looks like an act of war by America. And he took the pictures out and he said, no, look. These are definitely Cuban planes, which the photographs proved that they were American planes because of the nose on the plane were made out of metal, which was not how the Cuban planes were. So Kennedy was like, shit, what now? And they said, well, just still have the Cubans go invade the Bay of Pigs, uh, 1961, but we won't back them up at all. <laughs> And we'll just see what happens. Well, you know, uh, aside from people in Castro's army being among the people trained to invade the Bay of Pigs. So they had the army just waiting there. The tide was working against the attack boats. So it took them like twice as long to get to shore where they just all got captured and killed. Um, so and then America put a bunch of nuclear weapons in Turkey, which uh, can reach Russia about the same length of time that a nuclear missile would take to get from Cuba to Florida. So Brezhnev said, well, hey, Cuba, we're going to give you some nuclear weapons. And when the ships, the shipments of the weapons started going to Cuba, that's when uh, Kennedy fired uh, John Dull or Alan Dulles as the head of the CIA. He blamed him for the Bay of Pigs failure or whatever. And this standoff began. The uh, Cuban yeah. Missile Crisis. Yeah. Uh, you know, Operation Mongoose became Operation Northwoods, which was basically give us what we need to make happen to make it so we can invade Cuba. So they talked about sinking boatloads of Cuban refugees and claiming Cuba did it. They talked about shooting down aircraft and saying Cuba did it. Uh, but then in April, that's when uh, the missiles that you, you might hear them talked about as the Jupiter missiles were stationed in Turkey. And then Khrushchev offered Cuba nukes to sort of say fuck you and to also help them negotiate their way out of the embargo that had been on them for three or four years. And that's where we are now in the film. Yeah. yeah. If you want to, if you want to timestamp that and have everybody skip it, I No. <laughs> that was not that long of an explanation and it they... really gives a good background. I I think it's fine. Okay. No, fuck that. They come here to learn, okay? We are edutainment. <laughs> Minus the tainment. I don't believe in time stamping. You listen or you don't. Be a man. 
<laughs> or a woman. We we want women too. Be a person or or pets. Pets can listen. Pets can learn. <laughs> we'll yeah. take door mice. We'll take any years we can get our hands on. <laughs> Do you know cats watch more? Or, I can't remember how much that guy. You know, you, you watch Scrooge all the time. Right. How many I mean, hours I, a day of TV do cats watch? Yeah, I can't remember exactly what it is, but that's why we need door mice around, because the cats are going to want to listen to them. <laughs> uh, my cats just sleep a lot. I don't know if they watch any TV. Um, okay, so uh, we've got to talk about William Castle, because that is who Wolseley is based off of. And William Castle got famous for doing a lot of gimmicks um <clears throat> one of the first things he did was a movie called macabre where he would bring hearses and uh have station nurses at the film and he would have a one thousand dollar life insurance policy uh for you if you bought a ticket in case you died of fright it also had a countdown clock. Uh, it's it's featured in the movie where they talk about how they have a certain amount of time and hours, and they would have a clock that would synchronize with what's going on in the movie, and you would see the hours fly by, like when cut scenes would happen and stuff like that. So that was another gimmick that he did, where you're focused in on the time and the little girl running out of air wherever she's supposed to be buried. Yeah. Uh, we've also got a House on Haunted Hill that used Emerjo. Which was basically just a, a skeleton rigged up to fly across the audience. Yeah, it never dripped blood on the audience, like they said with the ghosts, but Emerjo actually worked pretty good. It, it freaked kids out everywhere. Yeah. But next, we would get Percepto with the Tingler, where he would put, uh, like, basically buzzers on, on the seats that would shake the seats and kind of freak everyone out. They were industrial vibrators that were used to like, um, like almost like a paint shaker kind of thing. Like it would be the motor that would do like a paint shaker or um, that you would use to like settle sand or something like that. Like where you would actually need to vibrate a solid block or something like that. And when they put that near your bum in a seat, it really, really was uncomfortable. I mean, it sounds... Good to me. I mean, I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> Not that kind of vibration that you yeah, would actually. I, I, I had a totally different picture in my head when you said industrial vibrator. Right, right. You were thinking like a Hitachi wand or some shit, but nothing quite as good. Ooh, I have one of those. <laughs> uh, and he also thinks did like uh, Illusiono for 13 Ghosts where people had these uh, glasses where it could be red or blue if they were brave, they could put on the red and see the ghost. And if it was blue, uh, they could see it without seeing the ghost, which is actually kind of neat. Um, and he did he did multiple other things. He toured with his movies. But that's the point. He was bringing showmanship and gimmicks. And that is what Woosley is in this movie. And so I just wanted to give like a quick breakdown of, of William Castle and the gimmicks he would do. One of the other things that uh, was a really cool gimmick that he did... Um, Jeez, I'm trying to remember which movie it is, but one of the William Castle movies... Oh, The Tingler. It was for The Tingler. There's a sequence where... I mean, you're obviously the main gimmick is you're supposed to scream whenever The Tingler's on your back, so he would have people that would plant and start screaming to get people to scream as well. But he filmed an entire sequence in color, but um, painted the actress to be black and white and made sure the room was all black and white. And he would have blood coming out of the taps and up to the drain of a sink. So all you would see is this red blood and this stark black and white. And the gimmick works so well in that. It still looks amazing, even with all of the upgrades and uh, the conversions that we've got now and all the multiple scans that they've done of it. It still looks like black and white film with red tint over it. Like, I don't it's incredible. I don't know how he was able to pull that off, but he did. I need to get the Tingler Blu-ray. I need that. I need that in my life. I bought the DVD box sets of it from, or I think I may have gotten that as a present from my wife at some point in my past. And I've been slowly but surely collecting them all on Blu-ray as, as I go. Yeah, I've got the Brent, uh, the Vincent Price collections 1, 2, and 3 from Scream Factory. Yeah, I have those too. Um, but the Tingler never showed up. And I don't think they're doing an, a fourth box set since they did a standalone release of the Tingler. So at this point, I'm just I'm just like, I just need to go ahead and buy the Tingler. 
Yeah, I think it's time so. <laughs> for me too. <laughs> um, so while they are preaching to the crowd about uh, how bad this movie is, you do have a set of adults, some parents that may be important later, uh, talking about how people should make decisions on their own, uh, which is a good time for Lawrence Wolseley to appear and uh, start t- telling people that, hey, you know, I don't have a speech prepared, but here's this speech, which was really funny. And he hands out uh, free passes to everyone and tells him, you know what? Come see the film for yourself, which is pretty dope. There's something that he and his specific, uh, the actress who seems to be like in a relationship with him, but very flustered with how he treats her and is always constantly milking her for money instead of paying for things himself. Uh, played yeah. by the very lovely Kathy Moriarty, who has never looked better than she does in this film, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but there's like a little sequence where they have a discussion where this particular screening that they're doing is like a sneak preview that he is using to sell to a theater chain his processes and some of the things that he's come up with, because this is like a mega gimmick, serious thing that he's created and he wants to see how it plays with an audience and so does this particular gentleman that is going to be putting them in the theaters. So him handing out free passes, it isn't about, it's more or less just getting butts in the theaters so that this guy can see how it plays with an audience. That's the whole plan, you know, like how this shit is actually going to work. Yeah. Uh, And it's, it's really good. So at home, Gene looks through horror movie magazines and recognizes one of the protesters as Herb Dinning, a minor player in Woosley Pictures. Curious. I almost want to believe that that's an actual movie that Dick Miller was in that they took a still from, but I can't place it. So, or maybe it's a Twilight Zone episode or something. I don't, I don't fucking know, but it feels like it's an actual still from a real movie that they reused because that's the sort of thing Dante would do. Yeah, for sure, I agree, but I'm not sure where it's from if it's from something. Um, so the next morning, the seemingly wholesome Sherry tells Stan about her former relationship with an older guy, a juvenile delinquent named Harvey Starkweather. Not a Charles Starkweather allegory at all. No, not nope, at all. Nope, nope, nope. Not a bit. Uh, seeing Sherry with Stan, the angry and jealous Harvey corners the boy and threatens him if he pursues the relationship. Basically, Sherry's like, let's go look at Coral. And uh, <laughs> Stan's like, anything for you. And then Harvey's like, if you go near her, I will read you more poetry. <laughs> Which is a much more destroying threat than the actual physical violence. Because Demoral is a knife, Jerry. Demoral is a knife. And it's a big <laughs> knife. It's a big knife. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Life is like a river where you see people floating down it on different boats that people have. <laughs> the boats. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty I bad. I wrote better poetry than he did in, in high school. <laughs> yeah, I write better poetry now than he did in the 50s. Can you imagine being the person who was tasked to try and write the bad poetry and trying to force the worst poetry you can think of? Like, this is probably Claudia Millstone Jennings' poetry. <laughs> it was, it was just Do- Joe Dante guy. getting, like, really high and reading, like, teen, teen romance novels. <laughs> It's like Stephanie Meyer wrote their fucking <laughs> their poetry for God them. God damn. Um, all right. Uh, back at the school, we see Gene strike up a conversation with Sandra, um, who has received a week of detention for acting out during the air raid drill. Kind of harsh, uh, but whatever. They put Gandhi away for a year. I don't That's know that true. many people yet. <laughs> <laughs> that would crack me up this time around. Yeah, that that's that's a really fly under the radar joke. Um, so Gene and Sandra kind of get to know each other, uh, which is good. It's cute. Uh, after school, Gene goes and talks to Woos, uh, Woosley to ask him about Herb, Herb Dinning, and the filmmaker explains he you know he was trying to stir up interest in the movie. Uh, he didn't I- think anyone would actually recognize the guy. I love when he actually says Herb Denning and then John Goodman as Woolsey does a thing where I think he, he spikes his finger with the wire he's trying to use to tie down the tarp. And he's like, oh, I didn't think anybody would recognize Herb. And then he pays off the the exterminator. We, we also need to talk about that. He hires an exterminator to drive his van around with the 
with an ant on top of the van and then it has like the the stuff about mant on a <laughs> just like a tarp that's tied down across the van and he's like cruising around the base and uh various uh what was it like arcades or something like that to try and get kids attention i can't remember what he says specifically but he knows his audience so he's like yeah there's got to be people bored in these places and he gives the guy a buck <laughs> which in the 1960s was probably a lot of money but it's just funny he gives him one buck and this guy's gonna do this for the whole day pretty much uh and so uh woosley basically says well kid what do you want and, he, and gene's just like dude i just want to help you so woosley starts like telling him how things are going how he's outfitted the theater with electric buzzers smoke machines earthquake simulators hoping his otomo vision and rumble rama experience will exploit the heightened senses of fear gripping the audience yeah he invented 4d theaters that's basically what they're saying is that woolsey is the inventor of 4d theaters and surround sound right yeah hang out in a d box thank a woolsey <laughs> uh it's pretty cool so meanwhile we see Harvey, who has a run-in with Herb and Bob, and he attempts to steal their wallet, only for the two men to catch him, rough him up uh, to get their money back. But instead of roughing him up, they act like they're going to hit him, but they just kind of tap him on the face. It was cute. Oh, and also, as he's describing her, Herb and Bob to the kid while they're kind of hanging out, Herb and Bob, uh, Bob was a leg breaker, or no, Herb was a leg breaker, which is Walter Paisley, a.k.a. Dick Miller. And he came to collect a debt that Woolsey owed. And I guess he put Herb in the films and Herb's been acting ever since. And then Bob was an actual good actor who got blacklisted for being a communist. And now he's forced to work with people like Woolsey. And Woolsey says that he's even better than Herb or something like that. And you kind of get the feeling that maybe Bob was also a leg breaker as well. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, but they convince Harvey to look for a real job to earn money to win Sherry back. So that night, Stan uh, calls up Sherry and makes an issues why she can't go. So Sherry's younger brother blackmail, blackmails her into seeing a mat with him instead. That little so, brother is a piece of shit. He is the worst little brother I've ever seen in a movie. He's such an oh, yeah. asshole. What a dick. Um, what a what a dick, Miller. <laughs> no, no, Dick Miller, good little brother for <laughs> Sherry. Bad. You just said that like it was fucking. You were Frankenstein's monster. Yeah, I did that on purpose. I totally meant to do that. <laughs> I think the little brother in Teen Witch is a little worse. Okay. I've never seen Teen Witch cuz I'm I've never been a Teen Witch, but oh, I, I feel you. Darren got cut off so I didn't hear that. Yeah, the little brother in Teen Witch is pretty goddamn annoying as well, Darren. He's he might beat this one out, but they could they would probably hang out and talk about how to blackmail each other's older sister. Yeah. Yeah, they they met at the convention. Yeah. So Stan's excuse is that he's putting like uh sandbags somewhere at the school for the, the gym purpose team. room. Yeah. South. Yeah, all purpose room because it faces south. Okay, buddy. Uh, so we go to the we go to the main day. We, we are at the day. It is Saturday. Everyone is at that movie theater, and Sherry arrives with her little brother to see Stan and his friends. So she gives him shit for lying to her, and uh, inside we see Ruth Corday, uh, Woosley's girlfriend or chick i don't know what she's supposed to be poses as a nurse nurse and forces attendees to sign liability agreements warning that the film may scare them to death but don't worry gene says we ain't afraid little brother are we so it's <laughs> cute a lot of cuteness to this movie I'll, i gotta say that it's like just my, a lot of heartwarming things one of my favorite bits that they do that really makes me laugh is where she's dressed as a nurse and she's so over all of this gimmicky shit. She's just doing it because she's in love with Woolsey. And one of the kids comes up and goes, nurse, I cut myself. And she's like, that looks nasty. And then they just cut away. They don't even deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> where she's just like, I'm not fucking touching that. Yeah. And she does a, she does a similar joke later on that's really good. Yeah, I love that they went the extra mile to have someone actually believe enough that she was a nurse for help and she's like not going to help them. It's so funny to me. <laughs> So, uh, Gene sees Sandra across the lobby and offers to sit with her, and they kind of talk, uh, and, you know, they look at this, this 
display that's up with an arm coming out of an ant hole covered in ants. And we also meet Sandra's parents, who are very, who are the liberal parents we saw earlier uh, when Woolsey gave his speech to the protesters. I love how the dad does an oversized speech, too, where they're like, oh, that's really gruesome about the arm sticking out of the ant hill. And he goes, well, the point isn't whether or not we like it. The point is whether or not we allow them to tell us that we can watch it. And he's going through all this speech, and then she's like, basically silences i'm like dad you're embarrassing me but like you know she uses their names she doesn't actually say mom and dad yeah (laughs) i can't remember what the dad's name is but she like says it like in such a way where it's like dad you're embarrassing me and then she looks at the boy and then the parents being the cool liberal parents that they are they're like yeah you go get pregnant now go ahead (laughs) pretty much um so uh then we see uh harvey who is being recruited to work the special effects during the screening and uh, I would not be able to keep up with everything said on how to work that damn thing, but uh, good for them for thinking Harvey could. Oh, it's real simple. You see, whenever he says this, you just bip, 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 bip. This goes to six. That goes to two. It's not that hard. But never take this one to nine. Yeah, this one never goes above nine, ever. Chekhov's uh, switch has been brought into play. Yeah. So, once the film starts, uh, theater chain owner Mr. Spectre watches in delight as the gimmicky effects cause an audience to scream. Uh, so you see what he's brought back to this in my mind is the showmanship. Yeah. Uh, and it's great. I, I-, I love Mr. Spectre. That- I thought that was pretty fun. He actually represents a real-life person, too. I, th- I can't remember who it was now off the top of my head because my notes aren't here. Um, he reminds me of David F. Friedman. <laughs> <laughs> the way that he acts on the giant cigar and all that. He just reminds me of the sexploitation auteur David Freeman. Yeah, but he looks like a 1950s Lloyd Kaufman. Yeah, yeah, you, you could see that too. But it's just basically like the movie guy that just is really all about how to get butts into the seats, keep the butts in the seats, and then make those butts and seats also pay for concessions. Yeah. Uh, so during a particular scary scene, Harvey sneaks into the theater wearing a mant suit, uh, and terrorizes the audience, but gets super pissed off when he sees Stan and Sherry kissing, but hold, hold, hold up, you skipped my favorite fucking scene. Uh, our boy Gene is the best dude. He finds Sherry and talks to her and gives her a lie saying, oh, well, you see, Stan agreed to come with us, and, you know, with my father being out in those boats, you know, my little brother Dennis was so worried about it, and, you know, he's like another brother to my brother, and he forgot that he already agreed to go with us, and so that's why he had to be here. Stan's the only one that can calm Dennis down whenever he gets scared, but Dennis loves these kind of movies, so he needs Stan. Otherwise, it won't work. Please believe me, Sherry, so that you can be victimized by my asshole friend, please. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out. You think Stan's an asshole? (laughs) Okay. I don't think Stan's necessarily an asshole, but the way that Gene is going about lying and manipulating to her, that's kind of wrong. Okay, fair, fair. Um, (laughs) And by kind of, I mean very. But I uh, mean... I would be lying if I said that I haven't lied to a woman. So, you know, there's that. Yeah. So, uh, Sherry, uh, immediately goes and starts making out with him. She is all about it. I, I, I'm not saying she's not a virgin, but, uh, she got some experience. It's heavily implied that since she says that Harvey taught her a lot about her body and her desires, I'm thinking that her and Harvey hooked up. She decided she really, really likes sex. And since Harvey's been gone, she hasn't found someone that will fill that void, if you will. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, Harvey freaks out and starts attacking Stan and then flees. The children chase him downstairs to the basement and find the paranoid theater manager's fully equipped fallout shelter. We haven't this... talked about that actor yet because the theater manager hasn't really come up, but that's Robert Picardo, who is the other actor I was referring to earlier that is in almost every Joe Dante movie as well. Yep. Cowboy, 
What he and Dick are the garbage men and the burbs, right? He's the yep. other garbage man. Yeah, yeah he's okay. the one with the rainbow button and is talking about how it's their legal right <laughs> to dig through the garbage and stuff. Um, he's in Gremlins 2, although he's not in Gremlins. He is the leader of the security of the clamp building in Gremlins 2, which is one of my favorite Robert Picardo rules. Uh, I love him as the cowboy in inner space because he's a cowboy who's never seen a cow. He can't rope a steer because he don't know how. <laughs> yeah, so they uh, end up... Uh running into the fallout shelter and where Harvey is still chasing them. But uh, Stan pulls a gun out, points it at them, and uh, they run out. But they then realize the doors are shutting as the manager shows up and tells them. And Gene and uh, Sandra get locked in. And There's a as really it, neat sequence where he's screaming, let me in, as she's screaming, let me out, because she knows this is no way to live. She doesn't want to try and survive in a bomb shelter. And the theater owner, this is all he has. <laughs> it was supposed to be me. <laughs> it's not fair. And the really, really bad part is his fish is stuck in there, and he's got the fish food on the outside. He should have at least thrown the fish food in there for his fish. For real, what a dick. <laughs> selfish, uh, selfish. I think that shows his selfishness right there. <laughs> well, yeah. he's a typical prepper, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, hearing the thundering effects of the films upstairs, the two mistakenly believe an atomic bomb has already been dropped, and fear they are the only responsible. They are the only survivors, and they talk about the responsibility to continue the human race. And the one thing I really like about this is it's the opposite of like Greece Two. Where in Greece 2, the guy takes her to the bomb shelter and is, like, trying to push sex on her. This time, it's the chick going, we're going to have to fuck for the world. <laughs> and, uh, you know, no time like the present. That was uh, the actress's first kiss. Yeah, and she said uh, the guy, the boy who played Gene, did not like her. So it was very awkward. <clears throat> I actually really dig this whole sequence where they're trapped in the bomb shelter and then teenage hormones take over because no one's around and they're all about it. And like you you said about it, uh, her being the more aggressor of the two, I really like this movie specifically shows that the women have their shit together more and the, the younger ladies have their shit together more in the film than the men do. The men are just all kind of clueless and they're being led through life by the ladies in their life, which was kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Cause even though the guys are the heroes of the movies, they really rely on the level headedness of the women that are in this film. Yeah. They, they find a way to like the everyday stuff. It seems like Woolsey just has no fucking clue about but, like, planning out a movie and doing all this crazy shit, like, his head's always in the clouds. But he always has a solution. It's just a matter of getting dragged back down to Earth in order to do it. But he always finds a way to figure out what he needs to do to get the situation fixed. Yep. So, um, they end up prying the door off, even though the door was not supposed to be able to come off. Uh, <laughs> I love when the theater owner tells him that, and he goes, he looks at him and he goes, boy, am I in the wrong business. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. So Woolsey, uh, Jean's mother, and Sandra's parents uh, see the two k kids in a romantic embrace. Yeah, they're like <laughs> full-on necking whenever the, the fucking door pops off and falls over. Like, they're just holding each other. And I love the line where uh, the mother asks, Jean, like, Jean's mother asks him if he's okay or if he's if he's doing okay or something. Or, yeah, are you okay? And then Woolsey kind of, like, leans over and gets all cheeky and goes, he looks like he was doing okay to me. And she goes, thank you, like, really upset about it. It's hilarious. It is so good. Uh, so uh, back in the movie theater, Harvey comes back out just like Mant and grabs uh, Ruth and drags her to the back of the theater holding a knife at her throat. Uh, he demands to, he, he demands money, uh, and he gets the money and then kidnaps Sherry. Um, the, <sighs> Stan chases after, but it's like, Stan, what the fuck are you going to do, bro? Yeah. I mean, even if he had the shotgun that he grabbed earlier in the bomb shelter, he's really only going to hurt Sherry more than help her. And I think Woolsey's the voice of reason here where he's like, whoa, 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 son, let's handle this. Let's let the police take care of it. 
you know, because he's not going to hurt Sherry. He just wants to take Sherry with him on his murder spree through the Midwest. Yeah, so, but he still does run after her, ends up just getting knocked out. But, you know, it's the thought that matters. So, back in the theater, we have uh, the uh, balcony actually being ripped off. It is falling apart due to all of the weight of the people up there jumping around in the uh, higher acoustics uh, that were set higher on accident. The rumble rombo was set above nine. He cranked it when he shouldn't have. Uh, yeah. They also they established that uh, earlier in a conversation the theater owner has because he says 100 in the balcony because they, they talk about how many people they can actually fit into the theater. And Woolsey says only 100 in the balcony. And he says specifically the regulations of that because it's the tropics, there's termites and all of that kind of stuff. That's all that they can legally allow up there for support. And it's clear that people have been ignoring that and like the balcony is over packed. And then you add the rumble rumble on top of that. And this is where the disaster happens. Yeah, and so uh, Woolsey ends up, like, shooting f or f towards the end of the movie where an atomic bomb goes off, and it convinces everyone that uh, it's exploding, and so everyone starts running out of the theater as the balcony breaks off, and everyone goes outside and realizes, oh, we're, we're fine, we're not dead, everything's cool. I like the little gay panic joke where the one guy's like, oh, it's all still here. And he hugs a guy and it being the 60s. The dude's like, hey, what do you think you're doing? Men aren't supposed to hug. <laughs> yeah. Get off me, homo. Um, I really also dig that Woolsey uses six different full-fledged 35 millimeter projectors synced together and put up with mirrors so that it basically reflects onto the screen to give that realism and to give that like like hyper realistic look to fill the entirety of the screen and the effects that he uses with the air blast and all of that other stuff. If you were in a theater and that happened where you saw that you would lose your shit. Like it would have been way too fucking terrifying. And as far as what they talk about in the conversation after they clear the theater with Woolsey and the main distributor guy, I think he's right when he says something about you could cause seat wetness. So we need to tone down that ending. Yeah. Think how awesome it would be if you went to go see Matinee in a theater and as a bonus, they showed like that 16 uh, minute run of Mant, but it had all the special effects uh, and all the gimmicks actually in the theater. Oh, dude, I'm all about 4D theater experiences. I, I really dig that stuff. I think it's actually really fucking cool. So if they did anything similar to that for, you know, in a theater run, I would totally be all about it. Yeah, even the nuclear blast. As long as I knew it was coming, I think I'd be okay. <laughs> For real. Um. So, uh, Dennis, uh, Gene's younger brother is trapped upstairs on the balcony. Uh, and Gene runs up there to get him, and it takes him a little bit, but he finally gets his brother to grab his hand, and he pulls him up, and uh, they run outside. Harvey gets arrested. Sherry kisses Stan again. Uh. You know, the audience is all happy because they're not dead. Uh, the venue has been just fucked up. That That's going under repairs. And it actually upsets a bunch of people because they're like, yeah, the theater's closed for the day. No more screenings. And everyone was like, what? Come on. I love that lady that holds up her kid and he says, he's been waiting for this all week. You tell him he can't go to this. And the kid starts bashing on Robert Picardo's theater owner over and over again and he's like i'm sorry ma'am the theater's been destroyed there's nothing i can do uh yeah so uh mr specter congratulates Wooly on his success and uh they start talking about ideas for uh, what they're next gonna do and obviously we have the seat wedding thing that's really fun also uh i mentioned this earlier when uh the kids are running out there's these two kids that are dragging uh the kid that we don't like and they see her as the nurse and they're like He's fainted, and she's like, so? Yeah, she's like, yes, Whatever. he absolutely has. Get him out of here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, then we, we find out uh, that the Cuban Missile Crisis has ended, and their father will soon return. And we then see Gene and Sandra saying goodbye to Woosley and Ruth, who are driving to their uh, next opening. And uh, we see the blossoming relationship between Gene and Sandra uh as we end the movie 
I really like that conversation that Woosley has with them where he's like, was that your first date to the two of them? And they all, they both kind of like sheepishly grin. And he goes, Ooh, that's going to be hard to top. You two will do it though. Like where he's just like, yeah, you guys have a future and all of that. And I also love where, uh, Ruth and, um, the girl are talking and she says, Oh, congratulations. You know, you're going to Cleveland. Congratulations or whatever. And Ruth just like very sarcastically goes, thank you. Or like, or something along those lines. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I just love the way that Ruth responds where she's like, yeah, Cleveland, uh, I guess <laughs> for congratulations. Yeah. And, and there's so much funny stuff in this movie that we haven't even talked about. We didn't talk about when, uh, Harvey punches out Woosley when Woosley gets, uh, confused as alfred hitchcock <laughs> yeah that, i harvey punching out um punching out uh woosley i really like this i didn't notice this before until watching it uh yesterday to do this recording but when woosley gets back up like after he realizes what happens he actually has his fist ready to go and he's like very slowly getting up and he looks behind him and realizes the kid's gone and then you see him like loosen up and like drop that fighting stance John Goodman looks terrifying. That look on his face with that fist that he has right there. I'm like, Jesus, I would not want that man ready to punch me for real. Um, and, and we also have it like there, there's also great scenes in the movie from Mant that are hilarious. They hit on tons of tropes. Uh, the uh, guy from the thing that we mentioned when we covered the original, the thing is the doctor who tells us how radiation is measured in Rankins and uh, gives us definitions of words that people may not understand. Cause it's, you know, geared towards kids or whatever. He's in. Oh that my God. The that's so funny. Um, the dentist is actually another Joe Dante staple who shows up in a lot. I think he was Martin shorts psychiatrist in uh, inner space that we keep bringing up as well. Yeah. He is either a psychiatrist. Yeah. I was going to say, or his boss at the grocery, but that's the other guy that's in a bunch of Joe Dante movies. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh so there, there's just so much we would probably uh it would probably take us three hours at minimum to cover everything in this movie uh in fact probably, if I, we could probably do two more shows on this movie and find different stuff to talk about really yeah, yeah we really could um but with that that is the movie you everyone needs to see it we're kind of uh gonna go ahead and move on to final thoughts as for me I love this movie. It's such a good time. I love any movie that kind of pays homage to old monster movies and stuff like that. I just think those movies are really fun. And it always makes me go, I kind of wish I'd grown up in like the 50s as a kid to be able to like watch all of these type of movies at drive-ins and stuff like that. Like, then I remember everything else that happens in the world and I decide against it. But for a glimmering moment, movies like this make me go, God, I wish I was a kid growing up in the 1950s. How cool would that have been? Um, I highly recommend this movie. It is so good. It's such a lighthearted, fun movie, even though it does have some heavy topics. it It's so adorable, and it's just... Every time I watch it, I just feel really good about life. So, uh, Darren, what, did you, what about you? Oh, yeah. I, I still fucking love this movie. Uh, easily recommended to a lot of different types of movie fan. Uh, although Gene and Dennis's dad won't be coming home so soon. Uh oh. <laughs> because uh, so the way the Cuban Missile Crisis sort of ended was uh, Kennedy sent Robert Kennedy to have meetings with uh, uh, Khrushchev. And to, they sort of tried... The, they didn't really... Kennedy being Kennedy, um, he didn't want to look weak. But he didn't want to... He, he didn't want to start a war. So that was cool. But uh, all the shit about Operation uh, Northwoods and all the stuff they had done... And stuff about Robert Kennedy going and having negotiations was classified for about 35 years. Um, the official story was Kennedy stood him down and he blinked. Basically, what it was was Khrushchev sent a couple letters to Kennedy saying, hey, let's let's squash this. And he's like, OK, we'll stop. We'll, we'll take our missiles out of Cuba and we won't send any more missiles to Cuba. 
we want you to get your missiles out of Turkey, please. Which is why this all started. And so the USA agreed to stop the embargo, which they stopped it a month later, uh, near the end of November. <laughs> and the, they said they would remove the Jupiter missiles out of Turkey, but they did that, uh, I think it was six months later. And the blockade ended on November 20th. And then, uh, you know, we that would be a whole other episode getting into the theories about how this led into the end of Kennedy. But um, <laughs> that would be more of a conspiracy theory show anyway. Yeah. Uh, it, a lot of a lot of names. It's very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, Jerry and I, you, you and I have talked about MK Ultra and yeah. uh, Alan Dulles and stuff like that. But um, Matinee, when I saw it when I was a kid, I liked it for different reasons, but it's still fucking awesome. Dope. Court. Uh, I don't really know too much else that I, I can really say about the movie, but I absolutely love this flick. Like I said, I've seen it over a hundred times. I never get tired of it. I always see something new in it. I always find something new. Um, one of the things that I was definitely, re I regret not mentioning as we're talking about it in the theater, when they're running around in various sequences, Joe Dante made sure to pack all sorts of amazing movie posters from films of this era, around this era, and, you know, even maybe like pre this era that would be stored in the movie theater. One of them that was like a really pleasant surprise was when they're running up towards the balcony, the movie poster for Vincent Price's Confessions of an Opium Eater is prominently displayed and it looks like it's like a vintage poster. Um, either they reprinted it to look like that or they found an actual one. Maybe Joe Dante has a collection. I don't know, but... I didn't notice that before because I wasn't aware of the film until just a few years ago. And then I watched matinee and see that poster. And I'm just totally, totally loved seeing that they put confessions of an opium eater, which is probably one of the less known Vincent price films. I don't know if that'll ever get like a, a, a very serious release. The most I've ever seen of it was like a, one of those burn on demand DVDs that the company that owns the rights to it now did. And that's the only way I could get my hands on it. Uh, this film is absolutely great. Absolutely love it. And it's kind of a fun double feature with popcorn. Oh, yeah. That would be a great combo. So, yeah. Th th it's a film you really have to watch. There there's so much you can love about it. And the I don't think The more you watch it, can... the more it rewards you, too. <laughs> It really does, because th there are a lot of great posters like you were talking about. There, There's a lot of just good stuff in this movie to find. So, okay. Well, with that being said, we are going to get out of here. But before we do, we're going to go around and see if anyone's got any new stuff they want to talk about. So, Darren, what have you been doing in the podcasting world? Okay, let's see. There is sometime around soon, because uh, the, I know these turn around pretty quick. You and I have our discussion about the documentary Hail Satan coming out on Psycho Semantic. And uh, let's just did over at the VD Clinic pod, we did the book Mind Hunter based off the book written by the guy that the show was based on, and Summer of Sam, because oh. we usually do those uh, serial killers in March for March Madness, but got behind schedule, so it's in March Madness in April. Yeah, March Madness got canceled anyway. I love Summer of Sam. It's yeah, it, it's it's up there in my my Spike Lee movies. Dope. Uh, Court, what have you got going on? Matt and I will be releasing. Well, I will be releasing Matt and I covering Brotherhood of Death actually later today. That we are recording this on a Sunday, so my releases go out Sunday. That marks the date for everybody that knows when that was actually released. And then we start May Mate. So we are actually going to be recording the first movie in May Mate tomorrow night, um, which, again, everybody knows is being released on a Sunday. So that is going to be shocking dark. And then we have Women's Prison Massacre the following week. 
Zombie 3, which is technically Lucio Fulci directed, but then Matei came in and finished it and fucked it up royally. And then the last film for May Matei will be The Other Hell. After that, we start the Andy Sedaris full franchise fest of the boobs, bombs, and bullets, or the girls, guns, and G-strings, whichever you want to call that series, but that's basically what the Andy Sedaris films are all about. That's fair. What about you, Jerry? I look forward to that. Um, I, I've been doing a bunch of guest spots, so I'm all over the place right now. Uh, but we, I record Kill the Cast tonight for Frozen, so that'll be out this week. Uh, hitting some Adam Green action. I did uh, I did an episode of Fresh Cuts on We Some of the Darkness. I did His and Hers podcast on Porno. I did... Uh, my trivia round for uh, the uh, uh, the horophilia trivia thing uh, that came out, and uh, I th- that's about it. Kill the cast is coming with. Oh, and I we did Godzilla versus Hedorah on Underwater Kaiju, and our next episode will be Polgasari, and we'll get into uh, what happens when North Korea kidnaps a director. <laughs> And lies to Toho Studios about where things are being filmed. So those will be tons of fun. Um, so get ready. We've got tons of stuff coming out. It's it's good fun. Uh, we also picked the what if we officially locked down what the next episode of Cult Unknown is. So that will that's probably like still two weeks away because we're just now starting research and those episodes take a lot longer to research. Um. But yeah, that's it. That's it for us. Thanks everyone for joining us. Go watch Matinee. Go love some Atomic Age uh, sci-fi. And we will see you next time. And I think we'll have to go back to uh, some overgrown, mutated uh, wildlife. I think, was it Black Scorpion time? I mean, we could always do Black Scorpion. Sure. Let's do that or the Giant Claw. (laughs) <laughs> I would prefer Black Scorpion over Giant Claw. Not that I don't like Giant Claw, but I think it's a better film than uh, Black Scorpion is. That's true. So we will see you next time, guys. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, remember, keep watching the skies. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.